What's up, you beautiful bastards? Hope you have a fantastic Monday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing we're gonna talk about today, by far one of the most requested stories today, and that is the story around Kim Jong-hyun. Jong-hyun was a member of one of South Korea's most popular K-pop boy bands. Massively successful, massively popular. Started in 2008 there. In 2015, he launched a solo career. And unfortunately, the news came out today that he is dead. Reportedly, he was found unconscious in his apartment in Seoul. He was taken to the hospital, and he was later pronounced dead. And as far as what happened, police told the BBC they are investigating to see if this is a suicide. There are some reports coming out saying that he sent his sister a goodbye text earlier that day. And if there's something I can try and do with this story, and, and, and I say this as someone that I personally didn't know of his work, this was a heavily requested story. So that's part of the reason I'm talking about this. But the other reason is, is to once again use very horrible, unfortunate news as a way to say if you are struggling with something, please get professional help. Please just try it. A, a, a fantastic inner circle can be great. But having that professional help can make the difference. And I say this to everyone, but also specifically the people of South Korea. I don't know how well known this is, but South Korea has exceptionally high suicide rates. Suicide is the fourth most common cause of death in South Korea. On average, 40 people in South Korea commit suicide every day. South Korea has the highest suicide rate of OECD nations. Unlike most other countries, their suicide rates have actually increased since the 1990s. In the age range of 10 to 19 years old, South Korea has the highest suicide rate in the world. And obviously, I think there's a big conversation to be had about the contributing factors to that, that that just exist in society. Whether it be high stress work or school environments or society trying to lock people down into a box or there being a stigma about mental health and seeking help. But on that last one, if there's anything I can push through and even if it connects to one person that needs it, please don't feel ashamed for needing help. There is nothing weak about needing help. And in fact, I think there is something inherently strong with understanding your situation and, and putting your, your hand out for help. And I get it. Mental health is a hard thing to talk about with, with people that that maybe don't suffer. I mean, I can't speak to the ridiculous fame high of K-pop groups. But hell, I just looked to the YouTube community and there are tons of people that suffer very real, very crushing depression. But they don't talk about it, they lock it up, they, they feel like they can't complain because people will say, oh, poor you, boo-hoo, making a lot of money from a job I think is very easy. But it doesn't take into account with things like clinical depression, it doesn't matter that things are going well. You've got these people soul crushingly sad, feeling even more alone because they know that there are people that won't understand them and feeling worse about themselves because they feel like because their situation is good, they have no right to feel depressed. But their brain is how it is, and that's why I think it's very important to get professional help, in addition to a small good circle around you. But that's where I'm gonna end this story. Hopefully we can take this, this horrible news and use it to educate others. And then let's talk about the outrage and general craziness around Miss Iraq and Miss Israel. So the story goes, Sarah Don was representing Iraq in the Miss Universe pageant this year. That was already big on its own because it was the first time in 45 years that Iraq actually had a contestant in the pageant. Also at the same time, she was getting a lot of hate for wearing a bikini in a preliminary competition. She was even forced to wear a more modest swimsuit for the televised competition. But the big story here was all about how during a pre-pageant photo shoot in Las Vegas, Adan and Miss Israel, Adar Gondelsman, took this selfie with the caption, Peace and love for Miss Iraq and Miss Israel. According to Adan, she was hoping the photo would show that they are ambassadors for peace and don't have a problem with one another. If you don't know, Iraq and Israel don't have formal diplomatic relations. They have a long history of hostility. And so, of course, that led to widespread criticism and outrage. And then reportedly, she says six days before the pageant, she starts getting threats from the Miss Iraq organization. The director of the Miss Iraq organization called me and said they're getting heat from the ministry. He said, I have to take the picture down or they will strip me of my title. But that was also the least of her worries. She started getting death threats online. Adan saying, people in Iraq recognized my family. They immediately knew who they were and they were getting death threats. But despite all of these threats, she refused to take the photo down. She and Miss Israel agreeing that they did not regret taking the photo and stood by their original message. However, she did agree to put up a second post explaining that she doesn't support the Israeli government, its policies in the Middle East, and she apologized for, quote, anyone who thinks it's an attack for the Palestinian cause. And unfortunately, that is not where the story ends. In the last week, the controversy reignited. This week, Miss Iraq told media outlets that her family was forced to flee the country. She said at the time all of this was unfolding, she didn't talk to the media, so her parents and other family members could quietly leave. As far as Adan herself, she has dual citizenship in the United States and Iraq, so after the competition, she returned to her home in LA. And she said she's been too afraid to return to Iraq since. She also said she was disappointed by the lack of support she received during all of this, saying, I'm here to try and paint a good picture about our country and our people. But instead, I get a negative response. I have no support whatsoever from the Miss Iraq organization and our government. The Miss Iraq organization responded, saying in terms of the picture with Miss Israel, we got a strong attack from the Iraqi street, but we did not say we would strip her title. We told her to clarify what happened. But to that, Adan says those statements are false. She has evidence to the contrary. And if there is a place I can end this, I actually want it to be on a quote from Adan. It's from when she's talking about the fact that she's standing by this photo, she had the best of intentions. And she says, a lot of people have the wrong idea about Iraq. And while we do have extremists, we also have good people. Most of the good people go unnoticed. And I repeat that here for you now, because I think it is very important 
important to realize that everyone in a place is not just one thing. There are people that hated her for this and there are people that supported her. And I just greatly respect anyone putting themselves out, trying to move forward, trying to call for peace in the face of adversity. I'm not saying I have the faintest clue of how you calm down and move forward in the Middle East. But I sure as hell know death threats to people calling for peace Probably not the answer. But from that, I want to share some stuff I love today. And today in Awesome, brought to you by Postmates. Postmates, of course, fantastic delivery on demand app. You want something from a restaurant, a store, you need some drinks for the party, but you don't want to leave. Boom, they got you. And for me personally, it is a time and life saver. What's even more awesome is if you want to try it out, like many from the nation already have, click my link in the description down below. Download Postmates. Make sure you use coupon code PhillyD. to give you $100 in free delivery fee credit. Check it out and let me know what you think. And the first bit of awesome today is the trailer for Mortal Engine because what the what? It's a movie where you have these giant mobile cities that can chase down smaller cities and towns. I can't wait to see what the hell this looks like. And honestly, this is me so excited. I, I don't know if I can wait for the movie. I might actually go go and read the, the books that this is based off of. Then one of my favorite series, Meet Arnold, put out a new video on what would happen if humans disappeared. Then we got a trailer for the new Netflix movie from Jack Black, The Polka King. Also, the fantastic creator that is CGP Grey put out a really interesting video. This on how to machines learn. Then for you foodies out there, Thrillist put out a new video all about dessert. They specifically go through a six course dessert special. And if you wanna see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, anything at all, links as always are in the description down below. And then very quickly, I wanna talk about a Charlottesville update. I'm sure you remember the man who drove his car into a crowd of counter protesters at the Unite the Right rally. Of course, killing 32 year old Heather Hare, injuring 35 others. He was initially charged with second degree murder and other felony offenses. But this past week, Charlottesville District Judge Robert H. Downer Jr announced that the charge would be upgraded to first degree murder. Now, unlike second degree murder, first degree murder requires the element of premeditation. And authorities said videos showing the Dodge backing up before it accelerated towards the crowd is evidence that the crash was intentional, prompting this upgrade to the main charge. And this massively changes his potential punishment. His initial main charge was punishable by five to 40 years, but this upgrade means that it's 20 to life. And even if he was found guilty, he got the lightest sentencing there. He's still facing nine other felonies. And where we are right now is a judge ruled that the state has enough evidence against him to warrant the case being presented to do a grand jury today. And if that grand jury issues an indictment, the next step would be a trial. So we'll just have to wait and see what happens next. And, and personally, I hope justice will be served. And then let's talk about a story that blew up over the weekend that isn't exactly what headlines would make you believe. So last Friday, the Washington Post broke a story that the CDC received a list of forbidden words. Very quickly, the story blows up. We see headlines everywhere, CDC, banned list. And according to the report, policy analysts for the Center for Disease Control and Prevention were informed of a list of words they could not use going forward. Those words being vulnerable, entitled, entitlement, diversity, transgender, fetus, evidence base, and science base. And senior CDC officials that oversee the budget informed the analysts that they could not use these words in documents for the 2019 budget. They also gave alternative suggestions for some. For example, instead of evidence or science base, they could use the CDC bases its recommendations on science in consideration with community standards and wishes. Reportedly, one analyst said of the meeting, it was very much, are you serious? Are you kidding? In my experience, we've never had any pushback from an ideological standpoint. Now that said, the CDC and human health services are dis disputing the Washington Post characterization. Matt Lloyd, a spokesperson for the Department of Health and Human Services saying, the assertion that HHS has banned words is a complete mischaracterization of discussions regarding the budget formulation process. HHS will continue to use the best scientific evidence available to improve the health of all Americans. HHS also strongly encourages the use of outcome and evidence data in program evaluations and budget decisions. Then on Sunday, the director of the CDC, Dr. Brenda Fitzgerald tweeted, I want to assure you there are no banned words at CDC. We will continue to talk about all our important public health programs. You may be understandably concerned about recent media reports alleging that CDC is banned from using certain words in budget documents. I want to assure you that CDC remains committed to our public health mission as a science and evidence-based institution. As part of our commitment to provide for the common defense of the country against health threats, science is and will remain the foundation of our work. CDC has a long-standing history of making public health and budget decisions that are based on the best available science and data and for the benefit of all people, and we will continue to do so. And here's the thing, I feel like the truth is somewhere in the middle. You may have noticed a CDC and HHS statements do not say a meeting did not happen. They don't say the analysts weren't told to not use certain words and documents. They just say there's not a ban. So it looks like we have a situation here where maybe there was a meeting, where there was a recommendation, but nothing official. Of course, the question becomes, well, why the hell would you make this recommendation? And the answer that seems to make the most sense to me personally is a quote from a former federal official they asked not to be named, but on this topic they said, it's absurd and Orwellian, it's stupid and Orwellian, but they are not saying to not use the words in reports or articles or scientific publications or anything else the CDC does. They're saying, not to use it in your request for money because
because it will hurt you. It's not about censoring what CDC can say to the American public. It's about a budget strategy to get funded. And I honestly think that's what we're looking at here. While it's a nice thought to think government agencies like these don't have to play politics, they do. All government organizations have to get a budget approved, which means that they have to play the game and they have to play to Trump. When Trump took office, things changed. And what every salesman knows is that you have to pitch to people as if they're individuals because they are. Right, like if you're trying to sell something to someone in Southern California, you're most likely going to try and sell that same thing in a different way to someone in Missouri. And ultimately where I land on this is I understand the alarm, for, especially from the initial headlines. I personally think it's a ridiculous situation that these analysts are in. But the real truth of the situation, like it often is, seems to be somewhere in the middle. Then let's talk about the train derailment in Washington. At around 7.40 a.m., an Amtrak passenger train derailed near DuPont, Washington. Multiple cars spilling off an Interstate 5 overpass. And transmission between the dispatcher and Amtrak 501 was captured just after. Hey guys, what happened? Ah, we were coming around the corner to take the bridge over I-5 there, uh, right north into Squally, and we went on the ground. Okay, are you, um, is everybody okay? I'm still figuring that out. We got cars everywhere and down onto the highway. Amtrak train 501 was part of a new service that launched just today. The train was able to carry around 250 people, but Amtrak said there were approximately 78 passengers and five crew members on board at the time of the incident. Reportedly, at least 77 people have been taken to the hospital. Four of them suffered serious injuries. The Pierce County Sheriff's Office did confirm that there were multiple fatalities, but at the time of recording this video, they had not provided a number yet. We also saw several motorists and vehicles that were struck by the fallen train. But reportedly, they just suffered injuries. There were no fatalities among among those in vehicles. We also saw the National Transportation Safety Board say they are launching a team to determine what happened. We also saw Washington Governor Jay Inslee declare a state of emergency. President Trump also responded on Twitter tweeting, the train accident that just occurred in DuPont, Washington shows more than ever why our soon to be submitted infrastructure plan must be approved quickly. $7 trillion spent in the Middle East while our roads, bridges, tunnels, railways, and more crumble. Not for long. Adding my thoughts and prayers are with everyone involved in the train accident in DuPont, Washington. Thank you to all our wonderful first responders who are on the scene. We are currently monitoring here at the White House. Now, Obviously there, the president has been criticized for politicizing a tragedy. Using this tragedy where people have died and are still fighting for their life as a way to push through his plan, all before an investigation has been done. We know, as I mentioned earlier, this is a new service, which should mean that there was extensive testing. We do know, and I'm not using the president in this week, that this morning was the first time Amtrak trains were using the new Point Defiance bypass route. That was a $181 million project that started back in 2010. But that said, I, I don't want to make this situation about Trump. And while these are just words, I do want to send my well wishes to those affected by this. Also, my thanks to the first responders. I can never say thank you enough for what you do. That's actually where I'm going to end today's show. And remember, if you liked this video, you like what I try and do on this channel, hit that like button. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button. Also, if you missed the last Philip DeFranco show you want to catch up, click or tap right there to watch that. We did a little something different with that one. Also, if you want to see the newest behind the scenes vlog, click or tap right there. But that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.